Bibliophiles of the internet, my name is Adriana and today I'm here to bring you my March wrap up. March was the longest decade of all our lives and despite everything I did read quite a few things. I tried to catch up with my arcs especially this month so let's just start talking about the books. The first book is actually one I read in two days and technically finished on Leap Day and that is an arc of Incendiary by Zoraida Cordova. This comes out on April 28th. It's a YA fantasy loosely modeled after 15th century Spain about a world where magic exists and where the royal family of Puerto Leones has laid down an inquisition to destroy all magic. Our main character Ren has the ability to steal memories and she's a spy within a small group of insurgents whose goal is to kill the prince and stop this edict. Content warnings for violence, murder, torture, graphic injury and death, and parental manipulation and abuse. Now I did read this as part of an arc tour, meaning the same arc was traveling between Latinx creators and that made for a lot of really fun marginalia, doodles, and annotations, so by definition that reading experience is inherently different from everyone else's. I felt like I was reading this book with my friends and my feelings toward the story are very much tied up in that experience, so I'm trying to acknowledge that bias. That said, this was a delectably twisty, exciting, intense story that had my full attention the entire way through. There was a great use of fantasy tropes like the tyrant prince, the turncoat turned spy, the reckless hero, the motley crew of rebels, the mysterious informant, and having to infiltrate the royal court. Some of the supporting characters could have been more well-rounded, but the main main characters are mysterious and dynamic, they're multifaceted and not easy to understand or place, but that's what makes them worthwhile to read about. This story is dripping with political intrigue and you don't quite know who to trust. The entire story is like a jumbled Rubik's Cube. When one tile slides into place, a whole other row gets thrown off, and I love that. I think the story really interrogates how we define ourselves. Is it by our ability? Is it by what we do with that ability? Is our sense of self defined by what other people see in us? Or is it a choice that we can make for ourselves? And it definitely speaks to internalized self-hatred and self-doubt, especially for Ren who was told that she's a failure and that every hardship in her life is her fault. It's interesting to see if she can move past those mental roadblocks and reclaim her destiny for herself on her own terms. Overall, I really enjoyed this story and I enjoyed reacting to this story. I definitely want to read more from this world and for that I gave it four stars. After that, the very first thing I read in March was my arc of Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas. This is an own voices queer Latinx contemporary fantasy about a trans boy named Yadriel whose entire family are brujex and they will not allow him to perform the brujo rites of passage because it quote unquote might not work. So he does the ritual himself and tries to test the waters by summoning the spirit of his recently deceased primo, Miguel, but he accidentally summons the wrong spirit. Instead of his cousin, Yadriel ends up with the school's resident bad boy, Julian Diaz, whose only concern is dragging Yadriel all the way into his unfinished business. Content warnings for misgendering, depictions of gender dysphoria, exploration of parental death, and nonviolent references to blood magic. This book comes out on June 9th. I did a full in-depth spoiler-free reading vlog focused on this book where I am visibly emotional over these idiot boys, so if you would like to know absolutely all my thoughts on this book, you should definitely check that out. Then I picked up my arc of The Space Between Lost and Found by Sandy Stark McGuinness. This also comes out on April 28th. It's a contemporary middle grade story about Cassie, whose mom has always been active and adventurous and larger than life, but when she's diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer disease, everything changes. Cassie's dad becomes more and more restrictive while Cassie is trying to preserve her mom's happiness, and when her mom forgets Cassie's name one day, Cassie realizes they are running out of time to have one last grand adventure together and cross something important off her mom's bucket list. This is not own voices necessarily, but it is very closely based on the author's own experiences with one of her parents. There's also, as you would expect, content warnings for in-depth explorations and descriptions of degenerative illness. As I said in my Goodreads review, this book is both beautiful and sad. Its beauty does nothing to negate its sadness and vice versa. What I appreciate about this story is that it's an honest exploration of how illness changes an entire family's life, but also how changing your life doesn't mean you have to stop living your life. There's no denying that the day-to-day -day reality of Cassie's family is drastically changing, but there's also the irrefutable fact that Cassie's mom is still a person with dignity, with feelings, and with hopes and dreams. While Cassie's dad is terrified of his wife causing a scene or acting strangely in public, Cassie realizes that she and her mom can still experience things together, even if it's only for a moment, even when facing the reality of her diagnosis. I feel like this story is about how people going through difficult experiences can still hold hope and love in their hearts alongside sadness and can still find sources of comfort. 
It's a really moving, emotionally evocative story that makes great use of powerful metaphors that will really connect with younger audiences, and I gave it five stars. Then I had a digital arc of The Life and Medieval Times of Kit Sweetly by Jamie Pacton. This comes out on May 5th. It's a delightfully feminist contemporary YA story about Kit Sweetly who works as a wench, aka waitress, at a cheesy medieval-themed restaurant. But she dreams of becoming a knight instead, not only because she's more than able to play the part, but because she could really use the pay raise to help her mom pay the mortgage and put a down payment on her dream college. When Kit learns that it's company policy that knights only be men for the sake of historical accuracy, Accuracy, she disguises herself as a knight, reveals herself at the end of the show, and ends up going viral as the Girl Knight. This inspires Kit and some of her co-workers to plan a huge performance in protest if they don't get themselves fired first. Content warnings for explorations and depictions of poverty, underage drinking and smoking, and mild parental abuse. This story is like the medieval shenanigans of Well Met meets the campy theme park vibes of Hot Dog Girl, meaning it's a story that's super fun, smart, and hilarious. Right off the top, I want to say how much I appreciate that this story is truly, truly feminist. When I hear feminist as a tagline, especially in YA, it sets off a little red flag because most stories that empower women and celebrate feminism are strictly set in a binary and act like anyone who's not a cis woman doesn't exist. That is not the case in this story. Kit explicitly says several times, it's not fair that only cis men get to occupy certain roles. There's a deeply supported understanding that true feminism benefits people of all marginalized genders. There's a lot of nuance like that in this story. For instance, Kit describes her family as being the working poor, but she also acknowledges that as a white girl from the suburbs, she still operates on some level of privilege. That privilege is what makes it easier for her to call out sexism and misogyny in the workplace, and I appreciate that whatever privilege she does have, she uses for the betterment of other folks. I like that Kit is not interested in performative feminism. She wants to end the systemic erasure of non-male warriors and historical figures, and she wants people of all genders and backgrounds to accurately portray the medieval era as a time where everyone, in fact, existed. There's a really sweet friends to lovers romance, a ton of super nerdy jokes and puns, a fantastic cast of characters, and stellar feminist commentary. I loved it, and I gave it four stars. Then I realized that ALCs, or advanced listening copies, actually exist. So I signed up as a reviewer on Libro FM, not partnered, not sponsored, and I got to listen to an advanced audiobook of The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. This came out on March 24th. It's a hard to describe piece of realistic fiction about these people whose lives intersect at the glamorous five-star Hotel Cayette. There's a young bartender named Vincent who meets the fabulously wealthy hotel owner, Jonathan Alcatis, on a fateful evening when the hotel is graffitied with the words, why don't you swallow broken glass? It's an evening that changes everything for the hotel and everyone in it, and Vincent gets swallowed up in Jonathan's affairs by agreeing to pose as his wife, which will ultimately lead to the downfall of many, many folks. I've been back and forth about this story because while it's quietly haunting and ethereal, it doesn't quite live up to the magic of Station Eleven, which maybe isn't a fair comparison, but that's where the bar was set. It does have the magnitude and sweeping vastness of Station Eleven in the sense that it's complex, all the pieces of a larger story are masterfully woven together from seemingly disparate narrators, and how all kinds of people are deeply and irrevocably connected by a single incident. To me, this story questions what makes reasonable people make unreasonable choices. It makes you question what are the trappings and fixtures of a good life, and what are we willing to do to secure those things for ourselves? Because I think a lot of these characters are willing to turn a blind eye to some deeply troubling things as long as it helps them secure this elusive idea of what their lives could be like someday. Personally, I got the feeling that the author was going for some kind of edgy take on self-interest and corruption, which is kind of like standard fare for adult fiction, and while I was interested, I wasn't exactly affected. If if that makes sense. It's a well-written, insightfully human story, but for me it was just okay, so I gave this one three and a half stars. After that, I finally got a chance to pick up Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. This is Charles Yu's latest release. It's an own voices blend of contemporary fiction and speculative fiction. It's a satire about this self-contained world that's kind of like its own Hollywood set where people live and die by the roles they play in these ever-continuous TV shows. Our main character, Willis Wu, has always played the bit role of the generic Asian man, but his dream of dreams is to become Kung Fu Guy because that's the absolute biggest role for Asian actors that exists. So it's basically about Willis fighting desperately to become the protagonist in his own life. 
Charles Yu is one of my favorite authors, and I love how his style of writing builds and builds on itself, constantly evolving and twisting the expected into the deeply emotional, and how his sentences start in one place, and then by the end of the passage, you're in a completely different place. This story is about how Asian descended people specifically will always be seen as foreigners in their own country, as secondary in their own lives. And it's about how our ideas about individuality and identity are so deeply tied up in predestined roles. It's about how the real tragedy of colonization and assimilation is the way it strips us of our ability to imagine greater things for ourselves. A great scene that puts a really fine point on this idea was when Willis is trying to tell his daughter a bedtime story, and he tries to start by saying, once upon a time there was a girl who, and then he can't think of a single thing, ordinary or extraordinary, that would come next. Kung Fu Guy is the only dream Willis can imagine because it's the only thing that's been dangled in front of his eyes his entire life, and he thinks if he wins this role, then he will win acceptance. Willis is struggling to realize that if he strives for these roles that other people dictate and create, it's just another way for the world to keep him unremarkably in his place. And when you read this story, you can't help but think about how life is just a strange, ritualistic performance. To see the way Willis rises through the system only to be continuously betrayed by the system is so deeply unsettling, and it's exactly the kind of realism we deserve to see in fiction. This is such a smart story that decisively uses Hollywood tropes and Asian stereotypes to illustrate a powerful reclamation of the self, and I gave it four and a half stars. Then I had a digital arc of The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. This is an own voices indigenous horror story about a group of four Blackfeet men who are living their separate lives when the unearthing of a disturbing hunting incident from their past puts them in a desperate struggle for their lives. Suddenly, one of the friends is visited by a creepy, murderous creature that's half elk, half woman, and hellbent on revenge for the traditions these men have left buried in the past. Content warnings for extreme amounts of blood, gore, death, graphic animal, and pet death, and graphic violence. This story is an effectively horrific look at the destructive consequences of cyclical violence. It's a literal take on how a past that is not honored and remembered will inevitably come back to haunt those who have forsaken it, which is a truly unsettling prospect. And to further contextualize that, especially with the indigenous culture of these characters, speaks to how systemic erasure and self-erasure are what ensure the destruction of indigenous lives. To me, this story is about how ignoring our pain only gives it more power, and how that pain takes on a very literal form in this book. Through the bloody vengeance of this inhuman creature, the story shows how intergenerational trauma, specifically for indigenous peoples, if not disrupted, is a powerful entity that ensures the colonized will destroy each other and themselves. And despite how disturbing and violent the story is, it's ultimately about hope and surviving impossibly traumatic circumstances. I'm not going to spoil it, I'm not going to say what happens, but the story does not end on a note of death and destruction, and given the conventions of this genre, that is an almost Herculean feat. I do wish the structure of the story was a little bit tighter, and for me the goriness was borderline gratuitous, but I thought this story had a powerful message overall, and I gave it four stars. Then Tor sent me a finished copy of The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Clune. This came out on March 17th. It's a wonderful own voices queer fantasy story that blends contemporary fantasy and satire about Linus, this completely ordinary caseworker for the department in charge of magical youth who's given a highly classified assignment to investigate the Marseilles Island Orphanage. Linus is the kind of person who reads the employee handbook for fun, so he is quite shocked when he learns this orphanage is home to six children with extremely powerful magic, a sprite, a gnome, a wyvern, an unidentifiable green blob, a were Pomeranian, and the Antichrist. Not to mention the charming and enigmatic headmaster Arthur Parnassus, who will do anything to protect his charges and keep them safe. Content warnings for moments of incurred bigotry and some brief allusions to past instances of child abuse and neglect. I have not read such a heartwarming, charming, joyful queer fantasy romp as this since, I would say, In Other Lands by Sarah Reese Brennan, which, if you've seen my Five Reasons to Read video, is the absolute highest praise. Reading this book gave me a reason to feel hope and joy, even considering everything happening in the world right now, and it gave me something to look forward to every single day. This story has the absolute softest slow burn romance between Linus and Arthur, and their love is only made stronger by how much they love these kids. 
and the children, I think, are the shining stars of this story because they're really just trying to solidify their sense of self in a world that doesn't understand them, that hasn't given them any kind of blueprint, and that constantly tries to shoehorn them into being described as monsters when they're not. One of the kids named Chauncey was always told growing up that he was a monster, so he started hiding beneath people's beds at night to scare them because that's what he thought he was supposed to do, but in actuality, that's not at all who he really is. So there's a lot of emotional parallels between the children and Linus with this idea that they were all told at some point that they were destined for certain things, when in fact our destiny is something we can determine for ourselves. And the story has a lot to say about reclaiming sites of trauma and repurposing them as sources of joy, as if to say, just because this place, this world was not good to me, doesn't mean it can't be good to someone else. This is such a sweet, funny, endearing story that has so much to offer in terms of self-love, self-acceptance, being unapologetically yourself, standing up to ignorance, and determining your own path. And to say I loved it is an understatement. There were some small moments of convenience, and the story may be ever so slightly overladen with platitudes at times, but by the end I honestly did not care about any of that because this was clearly a five-star book. Now I am filming this a little bit early, and the last book I plan to at least start in March is of course The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin. I will most likely be doing some kind of reading vlog for this, if not some other kind of video, so definitely look out for that soon. So those are all the books I read in March. It was a really fantastic reading month, at least, with a lot of new favorites that will definitely be making it onto my best of 2020 list. If you've read any of these books yourself, or if you want to tell me what you've been reading lately, leave me a comment down below and we can discuss. But that's everything I had for this wrap up today. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it and I'll catch you on the flip side of the page.